Welcome to this sixth session of the first day of the WCEF Plus Climate Conference. What an amazing and inspiring day we've had so far with many interesting stories of circular economy across the world. And we were able to really zoom in on the necessity of a circular transition in the global, in the context of climate mitigation. Now it is time to connect this debate to the financial dimension, diving deeper into the question of what role finance plays in enabling a circular transition and how the financial sector could contribute to a just transition. We will do that with my distinguished guests, each important players, thought leaders who can bring their different perspectives to this issue. First, I would like to welcome Mr. Michiel de Smet, who is the finance program lead at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and happens to hold a PhD in mathematics. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Desmet. Second, we have Mr. Selwyn Hart, Special Advisor and Assistant Secretary General for the Climate Action to the UN. What an impressive title uh, that will promise a, a very interesting discussion. And uh, you live for online gatherings like these, I saw on your Twitter feed, no matter what time of day or night. So welcome, Mr. Hart. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, talking finance, we need a banker, of course, and therefore Therefore, I welcome Mrs. Courtney Thompson, Executive Director of Global Sustainable Finance at Morgan Stanley, with a quarter of all US dollar investments following some form of sustainable investment. She believes that there's a power to change markets now. Thank you for taking part, Mrs. Thompson. We really appreciate it. Also a bank, but quite a different one, is the Inter-American Development Bank. This past October, Mr. Mauricio Claver Acarona started his five-year term as president, freshly started, full of ambition. Such a promising speaker is a pleasure to have you with us today. For all of you watching at home, please share any questions you might have for the speakers in the chat box, and we will come back to your remarks. Before we start with the discussion with you all, I would like to show you the importance of the financial sector for the acceleration of the transition towards a just, circular and climate neutral economy. Financiers and investors are confronted more and more with the downside of a linear economy. This kind of business is not future-proof anymore. Customers and consumers demand to know all about the carbon footprint of companies, the climate risks in their businesses and in their whole supply chain. They also demand to know the willingness of companies to adapt and transform their businesses, how they prevent stranded assets and strive for zero waste and value retention. Financiers have to look through different lenses when they look at investment opportunities and risks. What if all public and private financiers will change their investment practices? And what if industries around the globe embrace circular standards and solutions and will change their business models overnight? Imagine what impact such a development will have, accelerating the transition towards circular and climate-neutral economy. Therefore, it is essential that we integrate the circular dimension in lending and investment practices and jointly work towards a circular economy. Here we see not only the added value of the circular economy for reaching our climate goals, but also the importance of a financial sector that promotes circular investments as opposed to linear investments, of course. So, but how do we get there? What are the next steps? I'm happy to be joined by an expert on these topics uh, who is also the lead author on a recently published report on the role of finance in facilitating a circular transition. Mr. Desmet, what do you think of the session so far? Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's great to see that connection being made between the circle economy and climate change so explicitly. Mm. I think especially in the opening session, it's very clear that the circle economy is a necessity for climate neutrality. And many of the speakers were referring to the roughly 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, where the circle economy plays an important role as part of the solution. So very glad to touch on that one. Uh, but then focusing on this session, beyond that that, that connection, that broad, the high-level connection, um, obviously we've seen many financial institutions making pledges uh, linked to climate neutrality. Circle economy is a crucial part of the solution. So very important to be discussing financing circle economy in order to achieve climate targets. So in a nutshell, great to be here today, and I look forward to the conversation we're going to have. 
Good to hear uh, all of that. So let's dive straight into the content. Could you tell us a bit more about that report that you've recently published? Yes, uh, the report offers new analysis and insights. It shows how the uh, financing activity for circular economy has grown quite steeply in the past 18, 24 months. It lays out the opportunity, the circular economy opportunity for investors, for bankers, for insurers. In a nutshell, it has three key messages. First of all, it's about the circle economy presenting a massive opportunity to finance as it on the one hand will help achieving goals related to climate change and other global challenges. And at the same time, it offers a source of new and better growth. And then secondly, it's about the circle economy market. We've seen it growing very steeply across the finance sector in the past two years, say. And then thirdly, it's a call to action. We call upon the finance sector to build on that momentum, on that growing momentum, and to scale the circle economy together with corporates and governments, and doing so, capitalize on that transition. By the way, obviously, the report is available on our website, so I warmly welcome you to, to have a look for more details. Yeah, very interesting. Very um, very much taps into what I've uh, heard uh, Morgan Stanley say, so that's, uh, that's wonderful. Very interesting findings, especially in the light of what we have seen today during previous uh, sessions on the relevance of circular economy for socioeconomic development goals. Um, how does this link then to the important role of circular economy to solve the three global uh, crises? How will it help reduce pollution, uh, halt biodiversity loss, and mitigate climate change? Yeah, well, great question. Let me start with climate change. Um, we've heard many people referring to the roughly 50%, and it actually goes back to uh, research that we've done and published in 2019 uh, during Climate Week in New York, where we show how 55% of global greenhouse gas emissions are linked to energy. So if you want to address them, it's all about the energy transition. It's about moving to renewable energy sources. It's about energy efficiency. However, the remaining 45% is linked to how we grow and consume food and how we produce and use goods in our society. And that's exactly where the circular economy comes into play. It's about looking at our production and consumption systems through a material lens. So that's one element. And to give a quick example, if you circulate materials rather than producing new ones, you'll reduce energy demand by keeping the energy that went, went into that production in the first place. You keep that energy in the economy. Now, moving towards biodiversity, sorry, do you, yeah, shall I? Yeah, yeah, no, bi biodiversity, we hadn't addressed that, so go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. So biodiversity, if we look at the current economic practices, they're mostly are extractive. And that means that to visualize, if you take mining, that's quite straightforward. But if you look uh, into other sectors, such as food and feed production, extractive here means, for example, soil depletion. And by applying circular economy principles, for example, through regenerative production methods, we can reverse that trend and increase biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And then finally, just to touch and complete that question on pollution and take plastic pollution, which is very high on the agenda, together with McKinsey and the World Economic Forum back in 2016, we calculated that in a business as usual scenario, there could be more plastics than fish by weight in our oceans. Now, that's a clear shortcoming of a linear system, take, make, waste model. Mm. Now, a circular economy for plastics is a system in which plastics never becomes weight. And we've actually united over a thousand organizations together with UN Environment behind such a vision and concrete 2025 targets. So these are different ways in which the circular economy can help address those global challenges. So it's all very closely linked to the circular economy's business rationale uh, you just referred to, that, that momentum that you want to build on. Could you elaborate a little bit more and brief uh, on the added value of integrating circularity in financing and investment activities for public and private sectors? Yeah, I'll keep it short. Indeed, the economic rationale is at the core of the circular economy. Plenty of examples, large corporates, emerging innovators that use circular economy to generate value. So obviously, if you now move towards the financial sector, that equally creates a massive opportunity, not just to address those global challenges, but also as a source of new and better growth. To give one example, and you can see it on the screen, it can help attract inflows. We've calculated that Looking at public equity funds that are dedicated to the circular economy, the assets managed on the such funds grow massively from 5 million US dollars at the start of last year to nearly 7 billion by now. Early days still, but massive growth. And in addition, it could also help engage clients. H&M just recently issued a $500 million sustainability link bond where the pricing mechanism is linked to the increased use of recycled materials. So this is a way for the financial sector to start engaging uh, and uh, advising their clients taking a circular economy framework.
And I can also imagine that it must be linked to the relevance of circular applications if you look at a post-COVID-19 world for as far as we can already imagine that. Uh, green recovery, build back better, um, right? Yeah, definitely. So we see all over the world, we see trillions of dollars in economic stimulus packages. And at the same time, people are calling for a recovery that's a just recovery and addressing the other global challenges in parallel. Now, as a circular economy is driving the shift from an extractive model to a regenerative model, it also helps to decouple economic growth from resource use and environmental negative impact. Mm -hmm. And as such, it opens up the way for resilient recovery. So it really is about building long-term resilience, generating business opportunities, and providing environmental and societal benefits. And I won't go too much into detail, but looking at the EU, looking at the EU Green Deal, and how the circular economy is a key pillar of that deal, of that growth strategy, and combining it with more recent uh, actions such as the Next Generation EU, which is a 750 billion euro recovery fund, and how the circle economy plays a role in the taxonomy, which then plays a role in, in that fund and in the EU Green Deal, you see that circle economy is woven into those growth strategies and practical actions forward. So in short, the circle economy framework offers a tangible pathway towards a low carbon and prosperous recovery. Yeah, and that is becoming more and more part of the of, of the actual economy. Um, um, we have a question coming in. How does um, um, uh, the um, uh, thank you for now? We're going to leave it uh, at that. Uh, thank you for these enlightening comments. This has really set the scene for the upcoming discussion. Thank you so much. Um, before we continue our conversation, we have a, um, a short uh, Q&A. I would like to, uh, to see what kind of questions are coming in. So we'd like to drive, how do we drive the circular economy understanding risk mitigation of the finance houses to expand thinking beyond just uh, to uh, just the triple bottom line? That's a question that uh, has come in for Selwyn Hart, uh, who is the uh, next uh, person on the, on the list um, to, for me to talk with, um, a special advisor and assistant secretary general for climate action. Um, yeah, so how would you answer this question? How do we drive the circular economy, understanding risk mitigation of the finance houses to expand thinking beyond just the triple bottom line? Thank you so much. And um, I just want to thank you for for this excellent opportunity to participate um, in this session. And very briefly, um, it, it, it is quite clear from this session, as well as the other sessions, that pursuing a circular economy, um, as, as well as pursuing a net zero climate resilient future, are two sides of the same coin and and, and 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 I think that as we try to um, as Michael said earlier um, ensure that this is embedded in recovery plans it must be embedded in the development plans of countries it must be embedded as part of their um, nationally determined contributions and decarbonization plans that many countries have submitted as part of their obligations under the Paris um, Paris agreement um, specifically, to answer your question, um, it's absolutely um, essential that governments in general send send the right signals, um, right signals to markets. Um, so efforts such as um, embedding climate-related disclosures um, um, in uh, um, as as a part of the policy and regulatory frameworks in key countries is absolutely essential. The efforts being undertaken by um, companies to commit to net zero, but also to back up those net zero commitments with credible near-term plans. Um, that's the type of action that will drive money and also move markets as well. Mm. Um, I'm not going to steal um, a Mauricio's thunder, but also um, the alignment of the MDBs with the goals of the Paris Agreement um, is absolutely um, essential if we are to um, move and embed circular economy principles as well as uh, the pursuit of a net zero climate resilient future at the scale and the pace required by by science. So, so in short, my answer is that we need action at multiple levels. Governments need to send clear signals 
um, to money and to markets, but we also need companies themselves and financial institutions and public financial institutions really to embed these principles in their policies, portfolios and work as well. Yeah. I, I was, if you talk about scale and pace, I wonder why is circularity not yet an integral part of the climate financing? Well, um, I wouldn't say that is not um, an integral part. Um, um, we, um, as it relates to the climate finance architecture, um, it, it, it's, it's not really, it has not delivered at the pace and scale required by the science. And, and, and this has been because of a number of reasons. The volume of climate finance um, does not meet, has not met the requirements of the developing world. Um, the political landscape around net zero is relatively new. In 2019, when the United Nations Secretary General convened his climate summit, about a third of, um, of global emissions um, had committed to net zero by 2050. Now, it's 65%. We have the two largest economies, the three largest economies, the US, um, China, and the European Union, um, with very strong net zero targets. 700 cities all over the world have now committed to net zero. Um, and we're seeing 21% 20, of large public companies around the world also committed to, to a net zero. Mm -hmm. So slowly but surely, the tide is turning. Um, and increasingly, demands for circularity to be embedded in financial decisions are being made. So while it has not um, occurred at the pace that we would like, I honestly believe that that is um, changing. And as we head towards COP26 later th this year, this is the moment. This is the moment for us to ensure that recovery spending post-pandemic, um, post that the nationally determined contributions uh, or um, indices that countries will submit over the course of this year mm. and the decarbonization long-term strategies that many countries are working on, that circularity principles are fully embedded, fully embedded in those plans and strategies. Yeah. And I believe that that will drive money and markets towards supporting their implementation. That will drive money and markets, and that's the type of incentive we need because we like the surely, but the slowly part, not so much. We need it to go a little faster. So I'd love to ask uh, the perspective of the uh, IDB, uh, Mr. Claver Carone, how does financing for climate mitigation and um, uh, development play out in the Latin American and Caribbean region, and what is the role of the circular economy there? No. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. One, I agree with Selwyn that indeed MDBs should take the lead, and we are taking the lead here at the end at the IDB in regards to Latin America and the Caribbean. Look, as you all know, greenhouse gas emissions come from exactly how we extract, produce, and consume. So if we adopt the circular economy in just five sectors, right, so steel, aluminum, cement, plastic, and food, annual greenhouse gas emissions will fall by about 10 billion tons of CO2e by 2050. And that's like cutting all transport emissions worldwide, which would be amazing. Mm. Shifting towards circular production and consumption models is critical for one, sustainability, for private sector competitiveness, as we all know, but also for effectively addressing climate change. And for Latin America and the Caribbean, the future is circular. And our portfolio should also be circular. The circular economy will soon become an essential element of our climate and development agenda for the region, and that's part of our agenda here. So it's really getting a more and more prominent place on the bank's agenda. That's very exciting to hear. Could you give us some examples of concrete financial projects in which the circular economy plays a role in your region? And do these examples uh, pay notice of the upstream projects uh, and the innovative business models? Yeah, absolutely. Look, first and foremost, we're helping countries update their nationally determined contributions during the season. We're incorporating the circular economy into this whole process to make it an essential part of their efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Here at the IDB, we support financial models that include 
impact bonds, for example, like green bonds in Chile. Uh, but we also envision impact bonds with a circular label, uh, those that can have repayment tied to recycling targets or circle of job creation. And that's part of the innovation we're doing here at the IDB. IDB Invest, which is our private sector arm, is already analyzing the portfolios of several financial institutions, primarily local banks, uh, but really to be able to see how those pair up against the circular economy taxonomies. And I think we have some good opportunities there. And that'll give us a sense of really the business opportunity around developing circular economic credit lines, which I think will be very important. Mm. I think it's obvious now that uh, circular economy really has uh, significant potential to contribute to the climate and socioeconomic development goals, which generates benefits on the ground for both um, people and planet. We've discussed the role of the public sector, but how is this topic being valued by actors from the private sector? I'm so delighted to have Courtney Thompson with us. I'd like to present uh, to you a short video to, in, uh, to illustrate why Morgan Stanley is committed to help solve the plastic waste problem worldwide before we talk with you. Um, so let's take a look. Plastic waste is not just a sustainability issue, it's an economic issue. Every single year, between 80 to 120 billion dollars worth of economic value is thrown away in the form of single-use plastic packaging. According to an MIT scientist we consulted, there is already enough plastic waste in our environment to bag the entire planet Earth. Plastic waste can be found from the top of Mount Everest to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the deepest point of the ocean. A single-use plastic bag has an average working life of 12 minutes, but can take 20 years to disintegrate into microscopic pieces. Every year, the average American ingests the equivalent of 52 credit cards worth of plastic. As business people, we should be profoundly offended by the waste of the plastics economy. This is a massive financial opportunity, potentially a trillion dollar economic opportunity. There's no other industry that I can think of where we take hundreds of billions of dollars worth of resources, turn them into something that may be used for as little as a few minutes, and then throw it away. The company that figures out how to salvage that and create value out of that is literally sitting on a gold mine that is out in the open for anyone to see. We have to address the entire plastic value chain, from how it's formulated in the lab, designed into products, used by consumers, and ultimately collected, recycled, or disposed of. The good news is we're already starting to see innovations and solutions appear. In late 2019, we worked with PepsiCo to issue their inaugural billion dollar green bond with a large portion of those proceeds going to reduce the virgin plastic across their beverage portfolio. We only started using plastic widely throughout our economy about 50 years ago. Marketers had to teach people to throw away plastic, oftentimes after just a single use. So we actually created this problem. That same spirit of invention, entrepreneurship, business, marketing, that can all be used to tackle this problem. I am optimistic that working together across industries and geographies, we can collectively solve this problem. Wow, that's a impressive statement um, Morgan Stanley makes and very fun to see that uh, throwaway living was something that was to be promoted uh, half a century ago and now we have to unlearn it. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on how a circular economy is incorporated in your business and uh, the financing practices, Mrs. Thompson? Absolutely. And likewise, thrilled to be here today and, and sharing uh, in this great conversation uh, and hearing from my, my leaders and peers across the industry. Um, so from a Morgan Stanley perspective, we've been thinking and working on sustainable finance for over a decade. Our global sustainable finance team was founded in 2009 to really drive the sustainability strategy across the firm. And we've seen this obviously be a, a growing area of focus and connectivity with all of our clients and our stakeholders across the business. It's really added value to our investor base, our corporate clients, um, and all the investors that we serve. And so really building on that decade plus focus um, in 2019, as was uh, described in the video, we launched our plastic waste resolution, which is a goal that we've set to help facilitate the prevention, removal, and reduction of 50 million metric tons of plastic waste from the entering the environment, oceans, landscapes, and landfills by 2030. And we know that as Morgan Stanley, as a financial services firm, we do not ourselves have a very large plastic footprint, but what we are really good at in the capital markets and the, and the clients that we serve um, is really helping to facilitate the flow of capital towards these solutions. And so we're really excited to be able to pull together all parts of our firm as we've done across 
ESG and sustainability and, and climate solutions over the past decade plus to really laser focus on this issue of plastic waste as well as we think about the capital markets. Very interesting. And great to hear that circular economy, um, and in particular, the plastics issue features prominently on your agenda. With regard to your financing and investment activities, how important is the focus on climate change? And what approaches do you have to address uh, climate impacts? Absolutely. I would say climate is obviously a leading focus with COP26 later this year. I think everyone in the, across the industry is, is laser focused on this. I would say three things relates to as it relates to Morgan Stanley's focus on climate change. Um, one, just earlier this week, we actually updated our commitment uh, towards financing solutions to the low carbon economy, now targeting $750 billion worth of financing by 2030 towards those low carbon solutions. And this is really across all of our businesses and the ways that we work across the capital markets with our clients. Mm. Um, secondly, just last year, we were the first large US financial services firm to commit to net zero financed emissions uh, by, by 2050. And as Mr. Hart mentioned, we've seen a rapid growth across the industry and corporates and among our peers as well, following suit and, and making these commitments. So we're very excited to be on, on leading of that in, in here in the US, um, but really across our global operations, of course. And then third, as it comes to actually measuring and tracking our progress and helping to set the standards for the industry, we're also the first and only large US bank on the steering committee of the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, which we think is a, a very important industry effort as far as codifying the robust set of metrics that are needed to track uh, verifiably towards that net zero commitment by 2050. Very important also the metrics behind all of this. We have a big session about that tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Claver Carona, how do you see the connection between development banks being part of the public sector and private investment banks when it comes to the role they play in de-risking businesses in the context of climate change and the stimulus for circular transition? Do you see potential areas of cooperation maybe? Yeah, 100%. And at the end of the day, look, all around blended finance is going to be critical to the circular transition as a basis for the collaboration with us here at the multilateral development banks. And as a development bank, of course, we need to foster and one of our priorities is to improve and strengthen that public private sector collaboration. Our role here is really to help the public sector enable circular economy financing at scale and to allow circular economy markets to really thrive. And I think governments can do this uh, and, 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 and promote such circular economy investment through like issue, like good regulation, economic incentives uh, and financing infrastructure, but also promoting innovation, uh, changing public procurement, using blended finance mechanisms to de-risk investment in that sense. For us here, and we'll, in our advice, you know, we counsel on new regulations that can raise or lower prices or redefine markets because we see that Latin America is experiencing today a wave of extended producer responsibility laws. Uh, we see Chile and in Colombia where the private sector is adopting the whole polluter pays principle uh, mm -hmm. per se. And that's changing the way they do business and moving away from the take make waste approach uh, that we are trying to get away from. So good regulation works and that's part of our advocacy effort. Absolutely. That's what uh, we've heard in other sessions as well. Mr. Hart, how do you reflect on the comments made by Mr. Clever Carona? How, do you, how to facilitate a common approach regarding stimulating finance for the circular activities? Oh, Mr. Hart, we need his audio. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear can you, you now. Me? I'm so sorry. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, yeah. please. No, um, as usual, I, I, um, I fully agree with everything. Um, <laughs> Mauricio um, said, says, um, um, I, I also wish to make the point um, from, from where I sit at the United Nations, it's absolutely essential that as we make this transition, we leave no one behind. Um, countries are, various countries are at different stages of development. Um, countries are recovering from the COVID crisis um, um, uh, for pace and scale. Uh, and take, for example, the issue of of transport. Between 2015 and 2018, 14 million used cars were exported from Europe, Japan, and the United States to developing countries, half of those in, in Africa. We have to ensure that as we um, um, accelerate circularity in the developed world and in other places, that developing countries are not seen or used as a dumping ground for all old technologies, old materials, um, etc. So this transition, this move towards circularity must be just and we must leave no, no country or no region behind as we accelerate this push. 
Absolutely. Um, Mrs. Thompson, how could uh, circular economy be embedded in the financial decision making of both uh, public and private uh, sector actors? Could a link be made with current approaches addressing climate change? Absolutely. I think one of the lessons we've really learned from embedding climate change considerations in investing is that there's no single way to embed it. It really depends which industry you're in. I think we've evaluated this, um, you know, if you look to metrics and frameworks like the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board and the different metrics they've laid out for different industry sectors, Morgan Stanley's own research team and our Institute for Sustainable Investing have also published extensively on this. But we know that different climate change risks and opportunities will play out uniquely across different industry sectors and across different, different regions of the world as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true for circular economy. When we announced our plastic waste resolution in 2019, we published a primer that really laid out a number of solutions to tackling plastic waste in particular, which as we know is one component of the circular economy. But even for plastics, we think about the value chain and some of the visuals that we just saw in the video. This is all about materials engineering, business model redesign, recycling infrastructure and sortation. This is really going to require a number of solution sets. And so I think it's really about taking a systemic and systems level view to solving these issues. I think it's, again, going to play out uniquely across industry sectors and different points um, in the growth journey of different companies and, and different sectors. So we're excited to see this all play out uh, in different ways. Interesting. So it takes redesigning business models and products, actually. Um, do you agree with this, Mr. Uh, Hart? There's no single way to embed it? Yes, um, there is no single way. Um, it, it, it is absolutely essential, though, that we have um, a, a global, globally agreed um, goal and a set of standards. And, and it's, it's absolutely essential that net zero by 2050 mm -hmm. um, becomes the global benchmark and that we all work to, that all of our efforts, whether we're at Morgan Stanley, whether we, we are at the Inter-American Development Bank, whether it's a country designing um, a nationally determined contribution, that we all work towards um, this common global goal and, or a set of commonly agreed global principles. Yeah, so we all need to work together. We were already discussing a little bit the potential areas for cooperation. What could they consist of, uh, Mr. Claver Carona? I heard that the IDB has a project on um, plastic waste management. Can you tell us a little bit more uh, about that? Mr. Several Claver areas of cooperation that I think we're going to do. Oh, am I muted? Unmuted? Yes, yes, we have your okay. audio now. Thank you. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No, indeed we do. And I, and I think that there are several areas of, of cooperation that we can have here in the circle economy agenda, uh, in, amongst which are, you know, solid waste management, including plastics, uh, which you mentioned, energy, also housing, mobility, transportation, and also food production. Obviously, and, and I'll take the opportunity, we welcome Morgan Stanley's plastic waste resolution program, and, and I and would laud them for that. We've also partnered up with Danone, uh, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Nestle, Dow Chemical, and others to reduce plastic and waste fo uh, footprints in that regard. Mm -hmm. And here, here in Latin America and the Caribbean, companies understand that circular solutions, technologies, and business models really can build resilience and seize growth opportunities created by regulations and market forces. And that demand is starting to materialize it, and we, and we see it. And if we work with investment banks such as uh, Morgan Stanley who's here with us then really that circularity will become mainstream sooner hopefully rather than later. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. DeSmet, how do you reflect on this uh, discussion? Uh, do you see any other potential areas for cooperation or sharing of best practices? Well echoing the, the other speakers I think there's the different players have their role to play. There's private sector finance, there's the uh, enabling uh, policies uh, through policymakers and regulation, and there's blended finance. As, as Mr. Claveco only mentioned, it, blended finance has an important role to play. It's about providing that technical assistant, expert structuring, advisory services. It's about attracting private capital. Mm -hmm. And plastics, again, is a great example. We not only have the infrastructure that has to be installed, but also the ongoing recurring expenditures that come with operating, for example, collection of plastic packaging. And then here, regulation, again, plays an important role, for example, through extended produce responsibility. So it, it really is about scaling circular economy by bringing together private sector 
and policymakers blended finance. Yeah, um, we slightly touched upon uh, de-risking business models before, but I think it's worth elaborating on. Can climate change assessments be linked to circular opportunities? Can those risks be managed by focusing on circular applications? What's your uh, take on that, Mr. Desmet? Well, extractive practices and extractive economic model comes with severe shortcomings that does bring um, uh, uh, risks with it. And as those shortcomings are becoming more visible by the day, the risks increase. And yeah. Plastics, again, is a great uh, example. Think about stricter regulation. We see the EU introducing a tax on non-recycled plastic packaging waste, or we see China's national sort policy effectively banning the introduction or the import of, of plastic waste. That's one type of risk. There's risk to, to brand and the social license to operate where we see large brands uh, being targeted in when it comes to their packaging uh, being found on, on beaches and so on. Mm -hmm. There's downside earning risk because you're not well prepared to anticipate changes in that supply chain. Those FMCGs, large brands and retailers asking for other um, other solutions. And there's even a risk of stranded assets, very much like we see in, in oil and gas, where you uh, are not adapting to that changing supply chain. And obviously the, the other side of the coin is the opportunity. How can you, through reuse, through recycling, anticipate that change and as a company position yourself uh, Absolutely. better to, to, uh, to be there? Mrs. Thompson, when, when you uh, work at a bank, risk is your business in many ways. So how, how do you view this? Yeah, those are many of the same dynamics that we're seeing play out across our book of business and across our clients. I think much like we've detailed on climate change, there's really a collection of both transition risks, which are around policy, technology change, consumer preferences. All of those are shifting and creating these risks of how do you uh, evolve with the transition and, and benefit from it and help accelerate it, as well as the physical risks yeah. of climate change and, and also related to the circular economy, of course, and how those will impact business practices. I think we're also seeing another, uh, I think, risk or opportunity, depending on how you look at it, is really shifting investor preferences, not just end consumer preferences. But one of the things we've looked at closely from our Institute for Sustainable Investing is surveying institutional investors, asset managers, individuals on their preferences when it relates to sustainability goals alongside their financial goals. And we see these topics around climate change, the circular economy, of course, plastic waste as part of that really rise to the top among investor preferences. And so that's another key, key piece of the puzzle. Absolutely, yeah. That's that's uh, another <clears throat> that's another perspective that they bring to uh, to your business, of course. What might be the role um, of multilateral banks in this regard? Would integrating circular economy in the bank's practices be relevant when it comes to de-risking lending practices and managing climate risks associated therewith? Mr. Claudio Carona, what do you think? Yeah, so, absolutely. And <clears throat> as I've said before, first and foremost, what we can do is to promote sound regulations and to help create some of those incentives to help companies navigate the transition. But that transition is overall going to require concessional loans or blended finance to reduce the risk and overcome some of the liquidity constraints that we're seeing on the financing side. It's also going to require technical assistance uh, for project preparation grants. Uh, uh, it's also going to require risk capital investment to spur innovation, also guarantees like first loss guarantees of sorts, uh, corporate and sovereign bonds also, uh, including impact bonds. So really a whole bunch of things here and there's a whole toolbox. And as a development bank here at the IDB, we also need to ensure that the transition to circular production is fair. Uh, and that's going to require new skills and new types of labor because there will be some winners and losers. Uh, but really, this is about the environment. Uh, and, 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 and in that sense, it's also about jobs and social development. So it's really win, win, win across the board. Mm -hmm. And we need policies that are going to help uh, displaced workers and their communities in that regards. And that's part of the role that we play. Yeah. So how could the impact of financing concrete circular projects on the ground be expanded to lending and investment activities at a global scale? Could this become standard practice? Mrs. Thompson, what do you think about that? Absolutely as well. I think building on all of the great comments thus far, I think when we set out to establish our plastic waste resolution, one of the things we did was ensure that this was really relevant across our entire firm and across all of the clients we work with. So it's not just about one form of finance. It's really all the ways that we work in the capital markets. How can we help individual investors construct portfolios targeting the SDGs like life below water and climate action? How can our investment management teams think about evaluating risks and opportunities around the circular economy across asset classes, across regions? 
how can our capital markets and banking teams work with corporates who are raising capital and targeting investors and uh, directing their use of proceeds towards these projects that we've described on the ground. Similarly, through municipalities and sovereigns, right? All of these players need capital and are deploying capital across the markets. And so that's very much our role, a, a large multinational bank, um, really thinking about how we can execute this. And I will say across the board, one other key ingredient that's been touched on in addition to policy is, of course, data. As we've seen on the climate side, we've we've really coalesced around the goal of net zero financed emissions by 2050. And Morgan Stanley's role of, alongside many of our peers in the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials is a great example of how we're trying to coalesce around clear, robust metrics and data to help us track towards that shared outcome. And I think we still need to see that play out and evolve a bit more on the circular economy and plastic side. And we're, we're eager to be part of that discussion as well. Yeah, I see Mr. Dismet nodding uh, enthusiastically data? Yeah, definitely. I think there's um, a, a need to, um, to better understand what circularity performance is and how we can make progress. And through that understanding, through in, in a consistent way, harmonizing different met methods also guide uh, companies as well as investors in, towards that common direction. Uh, on our side, as a charity, we've developed Circulitics, which is a circularity performance measurement tool, and we are working in order to uh, ensure that uptake and, and create that transparency that both businesses and their investors are looking for to assess uh, performance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we would have done a Q&A with audience questions and we have a lot of interesting questions coming in, so that's not the problem. The shortage of time is, though, so we will be sending all of your uh, uh, questions to our speakers. Um, and I would like to um, uh, go to a bit of a conclusion. I think this has been a very fruitful discussion, very inspired by your positivity. Um, this brings me to the final point of the session, which concerns uh, the next step, so maybe a shared commitment on some of the top Topics that we just discussed, uh, I feel like we can find some common ground. This session at WCF EF plus climate could be considered uh, a stepping stone on the road to future common action regarding the mainstreaming of circular economy in the international climate finance and investment practices. So could we envision the development of a shared agenda towards the new circular defaults in uh, public and private financing practices? Mr. Claver Carona, would you be on board? Unfor Unfortunately, we cannot hear you since uh, you have. Uh, oh. The, yeah. Oh, the audio. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so absolutely, 100%. And we got yes. We have to look for that alignment and work towards that common approach. And of course, that's why we joined. And thanks to the invitation from the Environment Ministries and UNEP and the Circular Economy Latin American Coalition, it's really like a multi-stakeholder effort. And that includes, like as we talked about, the public sector, private sector, the finance sector, academia, civil society. We have the Ellen MacArthur Foundation here. So we must all work together on this transition and count on us in that regard. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Thompson, what actions is Morgan Stanley taking to engage other public and private financial institutions to work closely together on climate change and the circular economy? Absolutely. I think we're both uh, an eager and excited partner with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and many other organizations working on this transition. I think we've had many partnerships externally um, across the industry on climate and other sustainability initiatives, and we're really excited to, to take part uh, and continue our leadership on, on plastic waste as well. I think in particular, we're really excited to partner with all of our clients across the board at Morgan Stanley, across regions and across types um, to really accelerate this, the solution set here. I think we really need to bring everyone together on, on metrics, um, and we look forward to seeing a lot of the evolution on, on policy and data uh, to support the transition and accelerate it. Thank you for Morgan Stanley's effort on, on all of this. Um, I, I turn to uh, Mr. Hart. What about developing an action-oriented agenda on circular climate finance towards COP26 to address uh, barriers and harmonize approaches, streamline efforts together? Would you join us, Mr. Hart? Yes, um, not only join, but the United Nations um, is determined to lead. Um, we have this once in a generation moment. Um, there is this growing global consensus, governments, private sector, financial institutions, both public and private, uh, have all agreed that as we recover from the COVID crisis, it needs to be a green, inclusive and resilient recovery. And I think that that needs to be the basis um, for us to ensure that we approach circularity, the fight against climate change, 
um, halting biodiversity loss um, with the urgency and ambition and delivering it at the scale and pace that is required by the science. But I just wish to stress that in doing so, we have to ensure that we leave no one behind. We have to ensure that the poor Samoas, the least developed countries, the small island developing states, middle income developing countries, that they are part that they're part of this global movement as well. Thank you for stressing uh, the need for a just uh, transition. What does the road after WCEF plus climate look like in this regard? What about the next step, Mr. DeSmet? I'm so, are you so delighted that everybody's on board? This is great. Yeah, very much delighted indeed. So as echoing the previous speakers, it is about the common direction. It is about a shared understanding and then translating that understanding in concerted efforts on the ground. Topics range, as we've discussed, from a common language like a taxonomy, data, measurement. It's about integrating the circular economy concept in strategies, in existing disclosure initiatives, um, in, in, in the range of leading activities that are out there, like SASB, like T TCFD and others. I think from a foundation point of view, we'll continue to collaborate with our partners like Morgan Stanley and drive progress on the ground. I think it's very important to not only develop a better understanding of how circular economy is a crucial part of the solution to climate change, but also demonstrate how it's a delivery framework in practice. And that's what we will be working on over the coming months. Great to hear that uh, concrete action will already be taken on a short time scale, and I will be so excited to hear the outcome of the round table. I would like to thank all of my guests for tuning in and sharing their perspectives on the importance of the circular economy in the context of finance and the role of both public and private sector. The announcement of developing a shared agenda towards COP26 sounds really promising. I look forward to the follow-up on that. I would like to thank everybody at home too for staying with us today, and please don't forget to tune in for the closing session of the first day of WCEF Plus Climate, which will come up shortly on Channel One. Thank you again. A huge thank you to all of our speakers and see you again soon.